Hello, today is October 11th, 2012. We're meeting today with Mr. Richard Goring to talk about his military experience in the Vietnam War. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Richard, or as Dick as you prefer to go. I appreciate you sitting down today to, to tell your story. As well. I appreciate you doing this, Brad. My honor. Let's start off, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born here in uh, Fort Collins, uh, 1943, November 5th. Uh, grew up in Fort Collins, uh, went to uh, college at... Uh, I oh, went Fort Collins High School. It was the only high school here then. <laughs> um, and it was a small town, about 20-some thousand people. And uh, then I went to, uh, uh, after high school, I didn't get very good grades and I didn't, uh, I didn't have any direction or anything, but my friends were all going to college and I wanted to become smarter. So I, at about 19 years old, started went to Northeastern Junior College in Sterling for a year and thought I was probably the dumbest person in the world, which uh, a lot of people will, will say <laughs> that that's true. But anyway, I happened to have work hard and got really good grades and, uh, and then I transferred to Colorado State here and went a year and then I started my third year here, but the Vietnam War had broken out. Oh boy. Uh, and I just was hearing more and more about Vietnam and I was wanting to be a clinical psychologist. That's what I really wanted to do and I, my grades were really good and uh, but I had this problem with, you know, do I, do I want to get a degree and graduate and, 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 and maybe go out into the world or, and then have to go to war? Uh, I want to get things over. If I, if I have to. Now there's a number of ways we could have got out of war, but I'm not trying to say this is heroic or anything, yeah. but I just come from the generation that thought, you know, our forefathers had to fight World War I, World War II, you know, I have to step up. I don't want to, I'm scared, but I felt I need to step up and also I need to get this behind me, so I joined oh, in boy. November of 66. Uh, and what branch of service? The Army. And of all the branches, how did you come to choose the Army? Well, the, um, with, it was the draft then, and um, there was uh, most everybody then was joining Air Force, Navy, and things like this, and uh, there really wasn't uh, many choices. So uh, <clears throat> that was, uh, yeah, I'd probably rather tried one of the other branches, but it wasn't available, so. Okay. Now, 66, had, had the controversy of the war and, and, and the demonstrations, had that started up yet or was that still... No, and as a matter of fact, that's interesting, Brad. The, um, you know, when I was going to college, we kind of buttoned down the collar and, and crew cuts. I mean, short hair, we respected our uh, the authority, we respected everybody, uh, and, um, and I can go back, the total... Uh, transformation three years later of what it was like to go back to college. So yeah, yeah, yeah we'll it was there was no um, conflict other than we were watching draft things on you know draft uh, burning uh, draft. Uh, it was starting, but that didn't really hit, okay. Okay. mean anything. Okay, all right. So uh, you enlist, and then how much further? How much sooner after you, you enlisted did you, did you ship off then to, to boot camp? Well, I was fortunate, and we call it basic training in or the basic, army. Just yeah. to, okay. <laughs> and uh, so I went to Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, did uh, basic training. Went to Fort Eustis, Virginia Army Transportation School. And 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 how was that? How was that going from civilian life into military life? Was that much of a transition oh, for you? Oh boy. Uh, you know, you've got these drill sergeants that yelling every obscenity you can imagine in any little thing that you do, and anybody makes a mistake, uh, you're up all night cleaning the floors. <laughs> if you don't pass inspe if one guy don't pass inspection, you all don't pass inspection, and uh, so it. Uh, I and then you have to do like fire guard, walk around every two hours. You got to wake somebody up, and so maybe two o'clock in the morning. I'm walking around going, I have 1,030-some days left. I don't see how... That's just basic training. So it was a two-year enlistment? It was three. Three years, okay. Yeah, okay. because I joined. Okay. All yeah. right. Draft is two. Okay. 
All right. So I went to transportation school, and we, uh, our class graduated from transportation school, and they had uh, orders that started coming in for, uh, you know, about uh, 200 of us that were there, and, uh, and from overseas to Germany to stateside, everybody's getting orders, but about 40 of us didn't go to order, get orders, and we knew what that meant. No boy. And so that was seven months into uh, uh, May. I joined in November and May. We got orders. Well, we had to go down to a place called Fort Story for uh, Fort Story, Virginia, right by Virginia Beach, uh, jungle training. And, um, and uh, we still, nobody told us we was going to Vietnam. We knew, though, uh, jungle training and all this kind of stuff. So uh, by golly, in seven months, I got orders. So in May, I'm on my way to Vietnam. <sighs> Wow. Which was a good thing because he wanted to get it early. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I would hate it to imagine uh, being in for a year and a year and a half and two years, knowing that I'm probably going to go. That's that's hard on uh, anybody. I think uh, it would be on me. It'd be yeah. easier just to face something. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have any uh, furloughs home before you shipped off? Yes. Okay. Yes. Matter of fact. Uh, uh, I was way behind on furlough leave because we got a Christmas break from basic training. So I was only in like five weeks and then I get uh, uh, two or three weeks and then we got our month before going to Vietnam in May. So, but it didn't matter because I'm going to be gone for a, a good year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So when I, kept, when I um, came home in, in uh, May before going to Vietnam, knew then I was gone, I remember um, Driving around my last night here in Fort Collins, I went to all, the, not all, but most of the places I grew up and the memories. Uh, I just want to see them one last time yeah. because uh, you really have to face the fact that you may not come back. That's right. I looked at my room and my parents and my brother and just everybody I kind of wanted to look at one more time just in case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, that must have been a tough. I can't imagine that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then seeing your uh, your folks not seeing you off the next day. At, uh, yeah. Uh, so I uh, take it you went to the West Coast to catch a transport then, or take your story from. Yeah, we went. We went to Oakland uh, Army uh, Base where we uh, for about three or four days, and then we flew out of there <clears throat> uh, to Japan, where we refueled, and we were on our way to Vietnam. And the whole plane, I mean, uh, even during all our AIT, they call it, advanced training and, uh, and everything, uh, we all laughed and we joked and, uh, um, you know, we're going to Vietnam and all this, that stuff. Really, uh, there's a little uh, an uneasiness for me and I think most of us, uh, but we're on our way to uh, heading from Tokyo to Vietnam's not that far, and the captain calls over the intercom, says uh, we were supposed to land in Long Bin, uh, which is close to Saigon, and he said uh, we are diverting you from Long Bin. They got rocketed last night, so we're uh, diverting you into Cameron Bay. Uh, now, uh, as we were flying. I mean, the whole plane, uh, even though we've been up for 14 hours probably or more, uh, we were laughing and joking. Mm -hmm. But once we started flying over Vietnam, we could look down there and see the war going on. We saw smoke and, and, and stuff. We could see it from the plane. That plane was so quiet. Oh, wow. That plane was so quiet. And that is the first time that you get this feeling that this is real. This is absolutely real. So then the captain, we were uh, uh, in Cam, uh, flew into Cameron Bay, diverted, landed there. Well, the one thing we talked about in the, in the States here is if you could get in Cameron Bay, if you could get assigned in Cameron Bay, you got it made because it is the safest spot. They call it the vacation spot. And by golly, I got assigned there. <laughs> now, were you were you flying over as a unit, or were you going as no, a replacement? No, just we went over just as a bunch, oh, as okay. a group. Okay. There was no unit or anything. All right. So um, and um, so I got assigned there. 
And well, let me ask you too, yes. what, I, as I've talked to various Vietnam veterans, uh, describe to me as the plane door opened and you walked out what that was like. Well, uh, uh, it was about 110 degrees uh, and it was towards evening and, uh, and it's chaos because there's people coming in and, and people going out and they're, 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 uh, they got you putting you in groups and stuff and we have to stay the night at this particular place till we're assigned to our units and they're telling us if we get attacked you gotta you got your you we had they had bunk beds uh and uh and mattresses which is the last time i saw those uh anyway um so get the mattress around you if we get attacked and you're in here get the mattress around you and so uh right off the bat um it's uh this pin yeah. in your stuff yeah. well it really kind of went away because in Cameron uh, I got assigned to uh, now I'm in transportation so we're offloading ammunition uh, ships uh, on the docks like merchant marines that bring these giant ships full of ammunition and and uh, and I'm kind of a I have kind of a smart mouth I mean I do it jokingly but sometimes and I uh, saw this fire uh, Fire Guard 2, uh, it wasn't Fire Guard, it was Fire something, I'll think of it, but uh, I asked my sergeant, now I'm just a private, I asked my sergeant, uh, what's this uh, Fire Squad 2? He says, well, that's where you jump into the bunker uh, if, if we get attacked, the ships get attacked. And this is an open bunker, just a hole with some sandbags. And, uh, and I said, well, now wait a minute. If we get attacked with these ammunition ships, we're going to be at the front of the pier right by these ships and we're going to jump in this bunker and do what? He said, well, you're going to protect the ships. I said, we're going to have a gun and mortars and rockets and everything coming in. And, and uh, I said, well, uh, Sarge, let me tell you, why don't you go ahead and type my court-martial orders right now? Because if I hear one ping off of that ship, I'm going over that hill. <laughs> of course, I'm kind of joking, but uh, anyway, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, uh, anyway, but so I'm there, <clears throat> and I didn't care for what I was doing, so I got uh, I got another job with Battalion S4 or G4 or one of those, can't remember, and it was the intelligence part of Battalion. I got in there, I don't know how, but I was working uh, with I had a first lieutenant who was my commanding officer. And now I've been there about a month and a half. And um, it's safe, we don't even carry rifles. Hmm. I got it made, I'm coming back alive. Uh, but I'm kind of bored. So anyway, uh, one day I get to itching down here in my pelvic region. And I thought it was what it was, and it's the pubic lice, they call them the crabs. I hate to bring this up, but this is part of sure. this is part of what life is. Yeah. So I went out in a bunker that I could see and looked, and sure enough, I never had these. I'd heard of people that did, yeah. but there's these little pubic lice there, and uh, boy, you can tell they're there. So I went back in. I said to my uh, commanding officer, I said, "Well, sir, it looks like." I finally got them, and he says, what's that, Goring? And I said, the crabs. He said, well, that'll teach you going down to the village. I said, well, no, I haven't been down to the village. He says, oh, well, yes, you have. And I said, no, if I'd been down the village, I would tell you. Yeah, I've been yeah, down the yeah. I said, but they're all over the toilet seats, you know. And he said, no, they aren't all over the toilet. I said, yes, wait a minute, sir. And I actually got up. Can I get up? Uh, can I get up? Sure. I got up because this is my humor, and and I'm a private still. And I said, "Sir, wait a minute. You wait a minute. You're a first lieutenant in the army, and you're a, and you are a cap. I mean, you're first lieutenant commanding officer. You're a graduate graduate in engineering from Cal Berkeley, and you're 26 years old, and you're a man." And you think crabs is a venereal disease? And he said, they are. I said, I can't believe it. <laughs> that, no, they're. And so I, anyway, uh, was just joking with him. Uh -huh. uh, I couldn't believe that he would think that. And so anyway, we were reading in the Stars and Stripes, which is our army newspaper mm -hmm. about this place that was 
the place we used to talk about, boy, those poor guys, Duck Foe, 1967. Those poor guys, that's all we read about was Duck Foe, Duck Foe. They were just getting hit bad up there. And we, we'd even say, boy, I hate to be up there. Well, guess what? A company got wiped out up there, a big part of them, and they needed replacements. So they took all the derelicts from our battalion and guess what? I'm one of the derelicts. Oh, no. Now I'm full field gear, full field gear, hopping on a C-130, going to, at that time, what seemed like about the worst place you could go. Now, I was scared getting off the plane when I was in Cameron, uh, but then when I got to Duck Foe, they meet you with a deuce and a half with a, with a 50 caliber machine gun. I'm watching this infantry coming back through the jungle as I'm standing there and they talk about the thousand yard stare. You've heard of that? Uh, please for those that are watching. Uh, uh, thousand yard stare, it's a, it's, a, it's a stare. They've tried to depict it in some movies. You can't depict it. You, you can't act it. Uh, it's like they're gone. Their stare is, they're, they're gone. Their mind is gone. And when you see it, you'll never, I mean, and of course they had boils and all kinds of stuff. That's the infantry guy. So we get on, we got, so we get transferred to our unit at, with stockpiles, ammunition. And they were just hit with a mortar and blew up half the guys. So I'm now in, at going through a double thing. Now I'm going through the same fear yeah. Except worse now. Right, right, right. So I get assigned there to Duck Foe and uh, the uh, commanding officer there uh, had us in formation and called me into the office and asked me, he said, I want, to, I don't know why, but he said, you know, I want the smartest guys uh, working with me. I'd like you to be on my, uh, uh, my staff here, you know, one of my assistants. I said, absolutely, you know. And I never thought of myself ever as any of the smartest guy, but I was really grateful. So I worked in what we call the headquarters. And uh, so our company offloaded ammunition and stockpiled it for the Marical Division, primarily. And we had a perimeter that was, um, uh, we call it the 101st Airborne, pulled our perimeter. They had tanks and armored personnel carriers howitzers and cannons of everything you can imagine, plus gunships and infantry all the time patrolling because we have all this ammunition. Now one night they had an airlift and we didn't know anything about it, but they just airlifted and it was a, it was a, uh, I think a uh, brigade, which is about 3,000 guys. It's what, so they airlifted out of there. I mean everything, they were gone. So I'm saying to my captain, what are we going to do? We're sitting out here. Well, supposedly this infantry company's coming in, which wouldn't do any good anyway, but supposedly. And then they uh, let us know about eight, nine o'clock that night, they couldn't make it. And I said to my captain, well, that's kind of like a date, you know, getting stood up. Uh, hey, uh, we're sitting out here, uh, Viet Cong country with all this ammunition and, and um, just can't happen to make it, sorry. <laughs> And uh, so we had to pull our own perimeter, but we don't have the firepower <laughs> even close to it. Left, and uh, you know the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese know this. <laughs> you know that. But anyway, about two o'clock in the morning, this infantry unit does come in. Uh, they didn't tell us. So we had a little firefight. But you can tell by the color of the tracers and stuff. It's, it didn't last very long. and. They were green, they call it, and they were just fresh from the yeah, state. Yeah. And, uh, and we weren't really good at fighting, so nobody got hurt, naturally. Nobody could hit anything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was um, one of the um, things that, and we never did get anybody to pull our perimeter, but we had to move uh, from there uh, 17 miles south because it was a monsoon season and we're on the coast. So they're offloading on the coast onto the shore and that's where we're sending the ammunition and stuff out to the troops. And um, so the, uh, we had to find a place, a cove within a cove, so 17 miles south, 
That means we were 17 miles south of any U.S. troop. And it was just two platoons of us went down. Well, we got intelligence that night that we were going to get hit. They knew we were coming. They had even the kind, it was just a, a squad, like 12 Viet Cong, and their weapons and everything were going to hit us. So we went down in a bark, which is an amphibious uh, boat, and, uh, and did our landing. Uh, and um, we got there too late to dig in or anything like this. Um, and uh, there's, I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere, and there is nobody around. There's only, you know, two platoons, that's, what, 50 guys at the most, and, um, and we didn't have time to dig foxholes or nothing, but uh, towards evening, here comes this gunship, uh, one of ours, a helicopter gunship. Oh, what a relief. I mean, just to see mm. that, and it's flying, and just the sound of it, and to see it just gave you a little bit of reassurance. And they come over and they open on us. They open on us, and, and fortunately nobody was killed, but they did uh, ruin a lot of our trucks and stuff like this. So we don't know what, uh, what that was all about, never, but uh, that was one of the things. Well, you know, uh, what's war like? War, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a little history to, to this place called Siwen, where, where we uh, ended up. Uh, Duck Tho, uh, when we were up there for about three months, two months, before we moved down two or three months, uh, it was uh, jets firing uh, rockets and stuff. Uh, Constantly, night napalm. We'd watch the napalm. We'd uh, uh, we'd have um, the uh, naval uh, bombardment. We'd have artillery going over our heads. We'd have short rounds. Uh, one time we were Duck Foe, The village was four miles from us, so we'd go into Duck Foe and and uh, those things were just like right over your head. And then there'd be short rounds. They just would land behind you, right? so you don't know. And uh, one night, uh, one afternoon, I'm coming back, it's pouring rain, just pouring, but it kind of let off, and I'm coming back with the Jeep driver, and he slams on the brakes. The Jeep slides, he jumps out with his rifle, and he starts shooting, I'm looking, there's two little kids down there, about five, six years old, seven at the most, probably, to him, they're running. He shoot on him, grabbed his rifle, and said, "What are you doing?" He says, "I'm Viet Cong." I said, "You don't know they're Viet Cong." I said, he says, "I said they're little kids." He said, "They're in the trash getting those tin cans. They're gonna make bombs." I said, "You don't know that." But hey, why would you do that? Nah. Uh, he says, "I got to be honest with you, Goring." He says, uh, "I'm going back to the states. You know, in about a month." I'm going to have friends that are going to ask me, did you kill anybody? And I'm going to have to tell them no. Uh, I don't I know what that, and this is what I found. Uh, I do know that a lot of people, not a lot, some, there's one thing having to kill people, but some people really enjoy it. Mm, wow. And uh, when you get to seeing this, and uh, and there is, and that is the first question usually anybody will ask you when you, especially young people, did you kill anybody? Yeah. That's the first thing they want to know because it's something glamorous. Yeah, right, right. About yeah. That. Anyway, uh, so the um, the duck foe uh, experience that we had a, had a typhoon come in. Uh, we knew it was coming, and they, they said it's going to hit right between Da Nang and, and uh, Bong San, and we were, that's right where we were, middle of it. So we, this typhoon comes in. We're, I'm, we're talking, I'm talking to the captain, you know, you know, there's only one road out of here, and uh, we're right on the beach, uh, and uh, we're waiting for orders and stuff. Well, it was too late when there, that bridge was washed out, so we're there. So um, I don't know what category, it wasn't a category four or five, but it blew all our stuff down. Yeah. And so for about 24 to 36 hours, 
were just, we just, if you could find an army cot uh, it, that was still standing, it would, it's full of sand and water, so you just climb in that and sleep. You're just soaked all the time. But being soaked, I soaked for 24, 36 hours. You're not cold over there. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You get rained on and just soaked, but you're never cold. You don't get the shivers or nothing. It's just so tropical. Yeah. So anyway, that was uh, the typhoon. That was an experience. Then when we was heading to Siwen from Duckfo, sorry about the fact that. That's I, okay. Um, and this would have been about uh, uh, November, no, probably uh, October. So we're um, going down just with our platoon on this amphibious craft, which has got these big tires, but it's, uh, and you could actually put a semi in these, but we had ammunition boxes and, and food and stuff where we were going. So we're heading uh, down. So we go out about a mile or two uh, to go 17 miles down the coast and it's right during the day and there's not a cloud in the sky and uh, even though it's the monsoon season uh, there wasn't really in, m the waves weren't uh, like they usually are they're perfectly calm and we're just down there sun and we're riding along and we are riding on top of the boxes so there's no nothing we didn't have life jackets or anything and all of a sudden here comes this darkness. Uh, I mean, it was unbelievable. And we're sinking. We're sinking in this darkness. And I, and I turn around and I look up and there's this gigantic wave, which I used to wonder if it was a tsunami or I wondered. And then I've heard about rogue waves. This thing was so huge and it was wrapping around us. And our boat was just going down and it was just wrapping and I do not understand how boats work and stuff. But this thing all of a sudden hit this wave and it rose up and our, our first sergeant, he always smoked cigars. This thing, why it didn't wash us all overboard, I have no idea. But his cigar was hanging clear down to here. <laughs> we started laughing. That was one of the scariest things. I mean that thing. I don't know how we ever lived through that. So we get to we get to uh, Siwan, and we're supposed to get hit that night. And I told you this already. And the gunship comes over. But you know, I don't understand the scared and the fear that you have. I didn't feel this fear. I don't know how it how had you develop a callus? Do you think at yeah. that point? Okay. Yeah, it had to be. Uh, I mean, I didn't. I wouldn't even think, didn't even hardly think about this uh, platoon hit, hitting us, I, uh, and um, and the fact I but but still had this fear that we're all by ourselves. So if anybody hits us yeah. of any, we're done. We're done. I mean, we're wiped out. Uh, but that didn't seem to um, uh, these things. You close out of your mind somehow if you can. Uh, you you shut these things out of your mind. So anyway. We get kind of established there with our unit, and we'd have mortars come in once in a while, but nothing really, uh, any huge things. Uh, now, I became in charge of quarters because I don't sleep at night that well. And charge of quarters means uh, when the captain and the first sergeant and the lieutenants are, when they're all sleeping, I'm in charge of the unit. and. Uh, now, uh, they uh, allowed me to do this, and that's what I wanted to do. So, uh, I would see at night, because of the drugs and stuff over there and the alcohol, uh, our guys would get high and they'd get drunk, and they would set and lob mortars into the fishing boats. The Vietnamese fishermen would go out and fish at night and they would lob mortars in there and explode and laugh. Everybody thought that was the funniest thing. And just, you know, and we'd go by and we'd, uh, if they had water buffalo, uh, that was like a farmer here having 10 tractors of the best quality of water buffalo. 
And you know, it wasn't nothing for us to go by and uh, boom, shoot the water buffalo. And then we had an incident where there was this, in this waterway, there was this, just 50 feet of water, there was this hill and uh, there were baboons on this hill. And I um, used to go down in the morning because I worked all night and and uh, they'd come down, the babies and the moms and the dads, and they don't, I'd talk to them, how the hell you guys doing, <laughs> you know? And then they, they were the cutest things in the world. Well, one afternoon I'm uh, in my tent and uh, I hear uh, a firefight going on. So, of course, I'd come running out. There was an infantry unit went up on this hill and they were coming down this hill they were killing every one of these baboons. They were uh, just laughing and having the greatest time in the world and just killing every one of them. I mean, they slaughtered them. And this stuff just tore me apart. Just tore me apart. So, you know, even up at that foe, we had a black lab that's sitting in our unit that uh, Dad and I come up and ask, what happened to the black lab? And this lieutenant said, well, He's a stray. I said, yeah, a lot of strays. Well, he, we don't want him around the come. Why'd you shoot him? I just don't want him around the company. That was my first taste. Uh, just shoot. You know, and the other thing about like uh, fights, you know, the guys that uh, you go out and you have a fist fight, not over there so much. No, you go out and uh, you have a fight, you shoot him, or they call it fragging. Uh, whether it's with the bayonet or you actually shoot them, there's much can be done over there uh, prosecuting uh, because, oh, and there's too many ways of, of um, in our unit we had a guy that was cleaning his rifle and killed another guy. He said he's cleaning his rifle, but we know better. Just so much of that went on. Wow. That, that uh, so much went on. How, how, did you, how did you function during that time? I mean, here you come from a, a, a quiet, Mid, you know, western town, civilized town. I mean, exactly. I mean, and and go to that chaos and that 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 destruction and death. I mean, how's that 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 has to start playing on your mind, or, or, or are you able to block that out? And you have to block it. You yeah. have to block it out. If you don't block it out, you're you're done. You've got to block it out. So you, um, um, and I don't know. I I've, I've asked that question even. As I still take counsel. Yeah, we'll talk about and, it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so I had uh, there's one day there's a bunch of guys around yelling that looked like a fight. Uh, so I go over to break it up. Well, they we had these little tiny sand crabs that uh, the cutest little things too, you know. And uh, until I like animals, yeah. but it's not just animals; it's just uh, senseless. Right. Anyway, what they're doing is they're taking sticks and they're chopping their. Uh, their legs off and laughing and I just asked, I just went to these guys, I said, a foul language and stuff like we, I yeah, said, yeah. do you have to kill everything that lives? Do you have to kill everything? Does that make you feel so effing good that you just gotta wipe everything off? And I just, you know, and then I walked away and they're kind of looking at me like I'm nuts, which it probably was, but after the baboon incident and after this, then the the Vietnamese, they're shooting out of their boats and all that. See, this is the thing that a lot of people, I mean, I got shot at by snipers, um, mortared, rocketed. I went through the Tet Offensive. We'll go through that real quick. Oh, but uh, anyway, none of that bothered me near as much as the senseless killing of animals. And when they killed the water buffalo and stuff, I said, N you wonder why they're out there shooting at us at yeah. night. I would be too. So, um, Tsai so Wen, it was a jungle, uh, and it was a Viet Cong stronghold. Uh, they, we found out later, they had tunnels and stuff uh, there, and they were blowing up tunnels while, while we were there. But we had uh, uh, big firefights. Uh, I was with this uh, full bird colonel in the infantry company, and I just happened. Uh, and they were attacking this hill, and it's just uh, 
like from here across the street, uh, and I mean gunships with the rockets and the miniguns and the, and the jets, the artillery's coming from Dakfo and the Navy is shooting from out in the sea. This is, and they are hitting this hill with everything you can imagine that lasted probably uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm listening on the radio and I'm looking through the field glasses and I'm seeing a few Viet Cong running and, and such. And uh, uh, it must have spent uh, 20 million dollars that, that hour and found out the next day they got one because they had these tunnels and stuff. Anyway, um, so we hadn't seen a woman in four months or anything, and they had a little cantina uh, if we just went through the village. So we, and we got a, a, a little pass to go over and have some beer and, and, uh, and meet some ladies. But we had to go through this village which was right next to us anyway. So we had to lock and load just to uh, go, and it was pretty spooky to go through there. But we got over to this uh, cantina. I call it a cantina, but it was whatever it was. Well, anyway, it was on the highway, um, and a lot of GIs uh, were there, and, uh, you know, probably 25 or so, and they got girls, and they got drinks, and. So we just ordered uh, our little guy, and we had our rifles, and, and here comes this uh, army staff sergeant, and he's six. And he's all upset about the girls or something. He's just upset, but he comes, and his eyes are as red as you can imagine. And he's pointing his M16, he says, I'm gonna kill every one of you MF people. That's us. We're just sitting there. And he says, I'm gonna, so it's, then he had an E5 sergeant trying to talk him down, saying, Sarge, you don't wanna do this. He said, yeah, I'll kill every one of you. And his eyes were just, and you're looking, staring down this M16, um, and uh, calm, I'm calm as can be, nothing I can do. <laughs> I, I know, I, uh, it's just amazing. I'm just sitting there going, well, I hope the sergeant can talk him down. It'd be nice if the sergeant can talk him down. There's nothing we can do. So he did talk him down. But these are things that uh, people don't understand about war. They think it's all, uh, you go meet the enemy and you all shoot at each other and stuff. But, uh, you know, we lost guys, uh, forklift driver up at that foe. Uh, uh, that one of the fork times went through him and killed him. In Saiwan, we had uh, our uh, we had our cooks. They uh, had to go to Duck Fo and they hit a mine, and four of them were killed. And one of the my friends made it through, but he wrote me from the hospital, and it was like a preschool kid, it was like a preschool kid, and I never did find out, nor did I care what happened. Mm -hmm. See, you, and that's what I've done counseling about because you have, pretty soon you just can't, you just can't care. Yeah. And um, so that's just, um, this highway, we had to go up uh, 17 miles to Duck Fo, and we had to do, um, and just every once in a while we had to take turns going up. Now this highway, and I've got, I've got uh, uh, the, the paper, the Stars and Stripes, because uh, I happened to save it, it was just opened. They, uh, it, they never could travel on this. Uh, they just opened this road. Now this is 17 miles uh, in enemy country, dirt road over hills and stuff, and um, it, they closed it at 5 o'clock. To only tanks. Uh, so our captain said, if you guys can't make it back, you know, if you can't get back, you stay in Duck Fall. Well, that was a Jeep driver and me, a different deep Jeep driver than the one in Duck Fall, but we didn't want to stay in Duck Fall and it was five o'clock, so we decided to come back and and it's still sun still up and we're going over the roads and you can only go about fifty, that's top uh, because they're just rocky and sandy and and there's mines all the time. I mean, it, but uh, 
I mean, they had to do minesweepers in the morning, they had to do minesweepers uh, all the time. Uh, but didn't really think much about that. But we come over this hill and here comes this squad, again, this is a squad, about 12 uh, Viet Cong. And uh, so we're kind of coming over and they're walking along and I look at them and they look at us and we just go on our way and they just <laughs> went on their way and uh, <laughs> and that. So anyway, Brad, uh, that's part of the the Cy Wen uh, experience, uh, you know, not being able to take showers. Well, that's what I, one of my questions when we had a gap is, I mean, I, just the, the physical aspect of it. I mean, here you, you know, you grew up in a semi-arid uh, state, Colorado, dry, treeless pr pr practically. Now you're in the, in the, the tropics yes. and everything's associated with that. You, you're probably not eating very well. You're you're not sleeping very well, from the sounds of it. Hygiene's awful. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, any one of those aspects would knock a man down. But then you've got the, the stress of war on top of that. I mean, physically, how did how did you make? How do you think you made it through that? I mean, physically. Um, well, I think physically uh, was no problem. It's the mentally. And, and on top of that, I mean, and and and. and it doesn't sound like you could ever let your guard down. No, you, you and, and how how a person mentally could survive that? I mean, I, I'm just I'm dumbfounded. I, I can't. Uh, I, mean, I am too. I've uh, I've but I I can say that there is a uh, there's it. You know, it's like um, you have fear, and 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 I am probably the least brave of anybody that you'll ever meet. Uh, but when it gets to be a way of life. It's just a way of life, and it's um, um, and it has to be. Your mind has to change um, because if you're going to be in fear all the time and just scared and shaking, you're 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 going to loony bin. You won't make it. You gotta somehow adapt. Well, how how did you adapt? Is it something that the army taught you? Oh, was no. It, was it some of the guys already there on in country that said, "Hey, this is the way you gotta act"? Or I mean, how did you know internally that oh, I've got to do this or I'm not going to make it? It's it just something that just comes to you. Or? It it comes to you, and I'm sure that uh, I've never been asked this, so I, uh, but I'm sure that it's the role models. Now, my first sergeant, uh, who was. Uh, uh, World War II, uh, Korea, and two-time Vietnam, and he had a third grade education, uh, couldn't speak very well, but he's the one we would follow any place in the wow. battle, because he, and he wasn't afraid of anything. So uh, that'll get me on to where we finally in November, I think, December, we moved from Sai Win into Quinh Yon, which is the third largest city in Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> so I'd been out in the field about five months in the jungles and boonies, even though we were on the coast. We were inland in some places. Uh, so, um, and it's just Viet Cong and North Vietnamese all around. Now I had to do a, uh, an evacuation. When I was in Duc Phu, I got some kind of a sickness uh, and uh, couldn't figure it out so I had to go to a, a MASH unit like MASH. Uh, uh -huh. It was the air, one, 101st Airborne. Now these are the guys that are getting all shot up and, and, and I just got a sickness. I kind of felt guilty, you know. But this doctor, uh, Dr. Bernie was his name, I'll never forget that, it was the best doctor I had over there. Here he had the worst of the worst and he really looked, he really was concerned about you. You go to the hospital there, and they don't care whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, he came in to me and said, I, we can't figure out what you have. So we're going to evacuate you down to Quen Yon. This is from Duck Fo. But he says, I, um, I, I, I don't want to you know, upset you or anything, but it might be malaria. And of course, I'm going, yeah. <laughs> uh, even though that stays with you the rest of your life, get me out of here. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, but it wasn't. So, anyway, that's a different story. See how I go on tangents. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, so we do a convoy uh, to Quinyon, which is about 70 miles, on the same road that uh, 
but we the convoy was I mean it had the first air cab and all all the gunships it was uh, a huge uh, uh, convoy of trucks of uh, jet fuel and ammunition and everything but we were just taking our platoon again the, the first that were the uh, not the whole company uh, at that time we kind of moved our company always kind of moved we had one uh, uh, platoon maybe in one area another platoon in another area and then uh, whatever uh, until we were finally all together in Quignon <clears throat> and um, so we were right down in the middle of the city the provincial chief the um, uh, military police Vietnamese the Vietnamese hospital was right next to us. Now that's another story. And um, and so right in the middle. So I wrote home because my poor mom and dad. That, this was a television war. They're watching yeah, all this sure. stuff yeah, and they're yeah. seeing all this. And and to get out of where I was out of, and I wrote back and said, you know, I think I'm finally safe. I'm down in the third largest city, Quignon. There's not gonna, you know, I'm out of that field. So everything's great. So I'm still CQ. I'm charge of quarters. And on the 31st of January, 1968, I'd heard the radio crackling, and as it, and they were talking about there's some uh, Viet, North Vietnamese that they uh, Viet Cong that uh, got uh, army khakis on, meaning our uniforms that they think got into the city, and uh, you know, and they're I'm listening to the radio about they're looking for these guys. <clears throat> And uh, this is when Tet <laughs> happened. So it's about 10 o'clock, and our company's quiet. And uh, I, and I, I've got paperwork and stuff I do, but I got it done. And I'm just kind of have my feet up at midnight. I'll tell you what. Oh, hell broke loose. It was beyond imagination. Uh, it, our compound that we were in lit up like a football field. It looked like because of the flares and everything, and the bullets and the tracers and the uh, and the, the rockets, the mortars. And I mean, it was not only loud, but it was indescribable. Yeah, yeah. And it lasted for 36 to 40 some hours. Uh, but that night. That sergeant comes over to me, and I'm an E4 now. I'm a, uh, <clears throat> but uh, he's an E6 sergeant, and he's telling me, Goring, you need to go wake Top up, our top sergeant. You know, wake Top up. He's, uh, you know, about 50 feet down the compound. And I said, Sergeant, if Top's not awake, he's dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what do you mean go wake him up? <laughs> and uh, here he comes, Top with his steel pot and his T-shirt. Strolling down with the cigar, with the, I mean, the bullets, just like a John Wayne movie. Huh. I mean, they're flying over his head and, and uh, mortars and, and all of this. And I'm going, Top, come on, come on. You know, uh, and he's just, I mean, some, he lived for this. This was the, oh, the war, <laughs> you know. So he gets in to our headquarters unit. Now, I'm a little nervous now because the bullets are hitting on our, wooden hooch and and all this stuff's going on and we have a bunker and uh, so um, I asked him top, top you know if you don't need me uh, I wouldn't mind going out in the bunker and he said that's fine you know I said but you let me know I'm right here and I'll come in and check so uh, I went out there and with the other guys and then I'd go back in and duck down and check and uh, and then pretty soon, a couple hours, um, you get used to it. Okay? I'm, we're sitting in the bunker and I'm going, you know, we're going to be in here all night. Uh, we need coffee. Uh, and I don't, the guy said, I don't need any coffee. It's got to go to the mess hall. Uh, so I belly crawled. This isn't because I'm brave. Yeah, right, believe yeah. me. Yeah. It's just that I'm bored. And uh, so uh -huh. I belly crawled to the uh, mass hall and got coffee and some cups and I belly crawled to probably in a little bit of duck walking back and got in there and we had coffee and then I go check on top and then 
uh, the next morning I'm off and we got our troops around the, our perimeter and this, I mean, bodies are just stacked all over the place, uh, down the street. Now, uh, and uh, you could see uh, deuce and a half with, it. these are the enemy, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, I mean, just bodies blown uh -huh. apart. And, and uh, that next morning, um, I'm really off duty because I pulled the whole night shift and our, we had sandbags up this high in our tent. So I went and with all the stuff going on, I just went and went to sleep. Now some of the guys would say, how could you do that? And one guy even said, uh, doesn't that scare you? I said, you know what? One place is as good as another. I, I can't think of safe, I got sandbags, I need a direct hit, you know. Uh, so might as well sleep, what, what else are you gonna do? So uh, then I had a dog in Quignon that um, I kind of took in, a stray dog, and, uh, and he, uh, we got a new uh, first sergeant, uh, and uh, he was walking, we had actually a two-story uh, wooden uh, headquarters at that time, and he's walking down the steps, and uh, and he's going, Gorian, Gorian, and he was just new over there. He says, get your dog away, and I said, what? He says, ooh, he's got an arm, you know, and uh, and we called him George. It was a girl, but called him George, <laughs> called her George, and he, he did. He had an arm that he just, because uh, he ate uh, pigs and, and yeah. chickens yeah. and stuff, uh, but he wouldn't eat our mess hall food. Huh. He'd eat the C rations and, and our K rations. He loved those, and uh, and he'd take a human arm and he'd chew on that. But I, I could bring him what we called our rainbow roast beef or our rainbow ham, and we called it that because it had all the different colors of the spectrum in there. And um, the um, dog would not eat that. Well, uh, you know that's another thing eating. When I first got the Cameron, I couldn't believe that we had uh, canned milk in a big pot, Kool-Aid, or coffee. Uh, so in the morning, the first time I was there, you go by, and if you want Kool-Aid or the canned milk for your cereal or anything, you got Miller moths in every bug you can think of. It's this thick on top of them. And um, if you eat a piece of a bun or a piece of bread, uh, there's all kinds of wings and, and body parts of the, in, uh, the insects and stuff, and you just get used to it. What you do is you just stir these uh, insects, I'm serious, or this uh, round enough, try to get as few as you can, and you just don't, it's, and you eat your bread, you just, uh, uh, yeah, you get used to that. Now, when we were in Quignon, see, they don't have indoor plumbing, so, these are all the sick people in the hospital. They just go out on the lawn. And there's a lawn and they don't clean it up very much. And we get a little wind when you're eating. And I don't know if it was the food that was made you more nauseous or the smell of the feces on the hospital lawn. But it was tough. The, the food. Sometimes we look forward to eating some sea rations. Uh, but the flies, the flies over there are the most intrepid flies. Those flies are not afraid of anything. You can't tell me that these flies don't have some kind of brain because they'll get on your fork and when you got a piece of food and they know you're not going to eat them and they will not egg and open your mouth and they're still not going to fly off. <laughs> and um, so, you know, the bugs and things, uh, we had uh, DDT back then that they used to spray. We had, uh, that was up in Duck Foe. Uh, we had bugs, they came over with DDT one night and we didn't see a bug for two or three weeks after that. Didn't think much about it. Yeah, yeah, right. We also got, um, uh, uh, one of the infantry units used some gas, uh, tear, tear gas on, uh, on a, in a firefight, but it, the wind came our way, 
And uh, so we got tears and all this stuff. We didn't have any gas masks and stuff like that. Um, so, Brad, uh, there's a, you know, the thing about, I think, the, the war, when I was in uh, Quignon, again, the safe, the safe place, I was going to wake up the, the troops one morning, and I got to walk across this compound, and it's dark, and here comes this tracer right over my head, and uh, I ducked behind this truck going, now that is weird. That's, that's weird. It's kind of upsetting. So I got to wake up these troops. So I get up and here comes another one right over my head. So I get down behind another vehicle. I'm going, now this is really starting to piss me off. <laughs> you know, because, uh, but it didn't, I knew this was a sniper and that, <laughs> I mean, <coughs> they were shooting at me, but, um, so what? I don't know. I can't, and now, when I think back to these days, so I got up after the second time, going, you know, I gotta wake the troops up. Uh, I don't have time for this. Huh. It didn't dawn that he might shoot again, and it didn't even dawn on me. It was more of an annoyance to you than, than, yes. than danger, huh? Well, it's, <laughs> it, it's you're so numb, you're so numb to, I think, what can happen to you, uh, that you, you totally uh, shove it uh, in the back of your mind. Uh, it's just like, um, you know, when we were mortared or rocketed, uh, like when we were mortared up in Saiwen, I tell the captain, I said, well, Captain Ewell, first of all, this was, uh, you know what, they hit the front part of our perimeter in the back, and that, yeah, that means they're measuring us mm -hmm. for probably tonight, and. Uh, don't think any more about it, and um, just forget about it. So, uh, you know, that's just part of the thing uh, that um, you have the um, uh, the fights, and uh, I had guys that uh, in in uh, Quignon that uh, one guy see. Uh, when, well, he shot up a, a tent in another unit. Well, the guys were gone, um, but he thought they were in there, but they were gone. And so what they do with people like that, uh, at least what they did, and I know this because I had the records, they just move them to another unit. So this guy was moved to our unit, and of course I see all the records because I'm charge of quarters, I have to see this stuff. So, uh, um, anyway, I get to know these guys, I get to know most of them uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, so one night he comes in and I'm gonna use the red eyes again. Boy, there's so many red eyes over there. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it's not from just drinking. Uh, and he comes in and he's saying, oh, I'm gonna, he's got this bayonet and he's like, Gory, you gotta help me. I said, well, settle down with, you got to help me. I'm, well, what, what's the problem? I'm going to kill that uh, guy. And I can't get in more trouble. You know that. I, uh, but I want to kill him. I said, settle down. And what happened is a lot of the people we had, uh, believe it or not, couldn't read or write. Um, we'd have to read some of their letters and we'd have to write help him write, or we'd write some of their letters. Uh, and this was one of the guys, and some of them I don't think really knew right from wrong, but uh, anyway, he knew he didn't want to get in trouble. And what some of these guys did, they didn't think. We had uh, our bunkers, uh, sandbags. We also had our tents and stuff. And uh, some of them just have to pee in the, in the foxholes, in the in our bunkers, on the uh, sandbags, on the tents, on the corner of the tents, and so one of the guys had told him that uh, that aggravating, don't do that, yeah. and it, and he was uh, type of guy who couldn't be told, and that's why he was trying to keep from getting in trouble. So 
Uh, I went to a fight one night in Quinn Young. I There's this commotion and here's this guy with 45 and the other guy's got him by the arm and and uh, that's, uh, and we got that one without incident. But um, we were non, a non-infantry company. We were a transportation company, but I talked to a, a infantry guy on the way back and we kind of said, you know, how many guys do you lose? And I think he said he lost, they lost uh, 12 or 14 guys that, there, that year. And here we are just a transportation company and I think we lost uh, 21 or two guys. That was just while I was in the unit. Not counting the one that was blown up that I that we replaced. Yeah. Um, the danger when you have that kind of war, there's no front lines. Right. So uh, you, I don't care what you do, where you're at, you have to live 24/7, not knowing at any time. You can get it. There's no safe place. And I don't care if it's Cameron Bay or what. There are safer places, but some of the safer places, just like that, can be the most unsafe place. I think a lot of people believe that, um, you know, watching the movies, this isn't to ever take anything away from the, uh, the infantry guys, but that is the glamour. You know, hitting the beaches, the Marines and the mm -hmm. Army, and, and it is glamorous. And the thing is, that my I, I mean, I owe my life to so many of them. I, uh, but, I, you know, when these guys are at a fire base out there, uh, they have cooks, they have supply guys. These guys may not go on the recons and stuff, uh, but they're all, but they're out there getting the mortars and the, and they're also getting the attacks that right, they're repelling right. and they're. So a lot of people don't realize that you can be a, a clerk typist, you can be a, a, a cook, uh, you can be a supply guy, you can uh, be a, a mechanic, you can be anything and you're in danger. Yeah. Uh, and how a person, what gets me is the Iraqi uh, Afghanistan guys uh, go back three, four, five times is beyond, and you don't think you get PTSD from that? I mean, how can, how can we do that to, the, to them? If, if I'd known I'd had to go back one more time, I don't think I'd have made it. And I knew guys that, that committed suicide that uh, they just couldn't do it. Again. So you, you were in country for one year then? Yes. Yeah. I've always understood uh, from talking to other Vietnam vets that there was like three distinct periods of, of, of a tour of duty and the two outside were the most dangerous. The first three months were dangerous because you were, you were new. You were pretty safe, it seems like, for the middle six months. But the last three months when you were counting your days down, it got, it got dangerous again. Did you kind of feel that same way or? Well, I think the, the, it isn't what it's being dangerous. It's that you, the first, I'd say, uh, the first three weeks, uh, you've got that fear you got to overcome. Mm, okay. Uh, if you haven't overcome it in the first month or something, uh, but you're still going to have fear. Yeah. Uh, you're still going to have it, but for the most part, you're learning to live, uh, knowing that you get it out of your mind that you can get it at any minute. You can't dwell on that kind of stuff. So I think the first uh, months, the first weeks over there, in my opinion are the hardest. Okay. Uh, the last weeks are even more difficult because uh, we know and we know people in, and we hear of them, the last day in country. The last day in country. And there's statistics on this, how many died their last day. It's appalling. Um, and um, they're just catching a ride to go get on their plane to go home and they hit a mine oh, or a sniper. Yeah. And um, I know my last two weeks, I, I spent a lot of time in the bunker. 
I actually, I, uh, when I never, you know, I uh, see a flare go up or I see some tracers going over, I kind of go in the bunker and I'm kind of doing that jokingly, but not really. I'm really starting to get Fair more enough. nervous. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Well, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about everything in country and, and, and the mental aspect, the physical, everything that's thrown at you. I think there's another component that I wanted to ask you about that we really didn't see in other wars back home and the, the chaos that was going on back home and the protests and stuff. Were you getting word about that? Uh, and, and if so, how did that uh, affect the psyche of not really knowing you're not really, if you're really being supported at home, like uh, the, the home front of World War II, for example? Yeah. The, uh, it's really, you know, it's tough when you go over and you, you're doing this for your country. Uh, and I wouldn't change a thing, but when you get over there, you start questioning. Are they right? Are they, are the protesters right? You know, I'm watching all this stuff. I'm going, I don't know. Uh, so now you're in this war and you're in all this chaos and stuff and now you don't even know if it's right so that's tough yeah 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 and how about you know, through that 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 one year over there did you ever get pulled off the line for some r and r to, to get away yes. from it yeah okay i got to go to singapore oh and i waited till um february i wanted to wait till my last about three months left because uh i just uh, liked it that way. So I went to Singapore and uh, enjoyed that. I uh, uh, first place I went was to the University of Singapore, and they're in English speaking because they're British, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it actually says University of Singapore. So they, I went into the uh, university, and of course I think I'm fairly well educated and stuff, and fairly well read. So I run into a. a young Indian uh, in the hall and say, you, uh, can you uh, tell me where uh, maybe uh, sci psychology department, oh, you want to know where the psychology department, oh, you speak English, yeah, I'm about, and they're just the most humble people. He says, yeah, I'm about eight other, ten other languages and stuff. <laughs> so they just were curious, and we weren't supposed to talk about Vietnam, but they had questions and I talked about it. So there's about nine or ten of us, and of uh, Malaysians, Chinese, just every, uh, you know, nationality, race, uh, and they are so brilliant. They know more about our history than, than we know. And their questions uh, were so deep. Then they would take me, they took me on the uh, University of Singapore Volkswagen bus, and gave me a tour of Singapore and told me wow, about wow. the, the um, history and, and things like this and I learned so much and that was one of the great things about my uh, being over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and tell, let's talk a little bit about communications. I mean in today's age we've got instant communications with computers and cell phones and such. What options did you have with communicating back home with like your folks uh, and, and getting news and such? What was uh, I imagine primarily letters, oh, but yeah, letters. any chance to phone home or... Oh, no, no, yeah. no, no, there's no, just letters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you kind of talked about a little bit uh, that, you know, this being the, the first true TV war. Uh, did your, your folks ever talk about what they were going through, knowing you were over in, in harm's way and... and uh, yeah, mom, uh, my mom used to, it just used to bother her most. Uh, and, um, but for the most part, um, we didn't talk about anything. Really? Yeah. You know, no, when I got back, uh, I was done. Yeah. I, now see, I got back and I had a year and a half left that I spent in Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, so I had a year and a half left to do, which was, uh, uh, enjoyable. Do you think that was helpful in, in you scaling back? I mean, as opposed to coming from a, out of country and, 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 and being discharged into the... I mean, was it, were you able to kind of di dial down a little before you... No, no um, you know, the thing is, Brad, I, uh, this is always embarrassing. Uh, not as much as I get older, I guess, but uh, um, 
I had leave after Vietnam, and uh, so I flew to Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, I checked in that night to my barracks, and I had a panic attack. I didn't even know this was what it was. I learned later. I didn't think I was going to make it. I, I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. I, it's one of those, I prayed to God, I'll do anything for you the rest of my life if you just get me out of this. And, and uh, of course, we didn't know what that was. Yeah, right, I just yeah. know that I'm really weird is all. You know, I'm just really a strange person and I ain't going to talk about this. So, yeah, that's the, um, um, the year and a half there, I'm still in the military. I yeah. still got short hair. Yeah. So uh, they all, everybody now with the long hair, knows that we're military, uh, but we had girlfriends. I mean, we met girls. Uh, it wasn't like everybody hated us, uh, yeah. which is surprising, but uh, um, for the most part, it was just like getting on with your life. Uh, but we were still, um, I didn't pay much attention to the protesters, didn't watch TV, uh, so I didn't really know much what was going on anyway. Yeah, okay. And, and describe uh, that last day the feeling and such when you got on that plane and and, and got it out of Vietnam airspace uh, that must have been I, I can't imagine the relief uh, the feeling you must have had leaving Vietnam what well that, let me tell you Brad that the what happens is the night before um, and this is the military or the government yeah. the night before we had to fill out these packets of stuff and we got this sergeant up there and he's going through this now. If you'll take the blue, uh, the blue card, and it's the blue card, and fill, and if you're going to put that in front of you, have got about 80 of these. Now. And now on that blue card, you're going <laughs> to print your last name. That's your last name. You go through this thing, and thing. Uh, and so anyway, uh, we did all this, and uh, the one thing I didn't here was that we were supposed to turn them in. So I took mine to the barracks. Now we're out drinking, we're having a party. We're going home tomorrow. And uh, we partied and uh, so excited. So I'm getting ready. We're the next morning, uh, they're calling out the names. And the guy's going home. But I'm noticing that none of them have their packets. Now I'm getting worried. Was I supposed to turn that in? No. Uh, and, boy, let me tell you, these, these sergeants mess with you. Everybody messes with you anyway. Uh, even when you go over, they call you a recruit. When you're a first go to Vietnam, you, they call you a recruit, like a recruit. And uh, they'll tell you stories that aren't even true. Anything scare you when you're first over there. And, uh, and they give you the worst duties and they uh, tell you, it's kind of like an initiation. Okay. Uh, they can be really, well, same thing with these guys. They get uh, processing guys out. The sergeant, uh, I get there and I said, Sarge, you didn't call my name and, and uh, I still have my packet. And I kind of think that, that wasn't good. And he said, no, it wasn't. Uh, so you won't, make, you won't get on this flight. And I said, no, you know, you didn't turn your packet in, you won't get on this flight. Mm. <laughs> when, 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 do you, when would be the next flight? He said, you know, we had these all booked up for weeks. It could be a couple weeks before you get on a flight. I'm telling you, your heart just drops. And uh, he was screwing with me. There was plenty of room. <laughs> but he didn't let me know yeah. until the very last second that I could get on that plane. So I had to agonize for an hour or so. So there, that's. Well, then when I got on the plane, I was excited. Oh boy! Yeah. And, and how was that? I mean, it was almost to me. It almost seemed like a time warp. I mean, in the previous wars, uh, people, men took ships home and stuff. You took a, a flight home, and and here you're in this jungle or uh, tropical location, war zone. Twenty four hours later, you're back in. Humanity, if you will. Yeah. Was that? Was, how was that? Well, that quick adjustment like that? I don't think. You know, when you're young like that, I don't. 
I don't didn't process things like that. I uh, uh, until later in life, uh, just you know, uh, coming back and looking at the cultural shock is. Well, that, I guess that's is, the question. Is, yeah. is what? Yeah. I mean, everybody's dressed different. Yeah. They talking different. They got long hair. They burning down stuff. Uh, they burning down establishments and. On our CSU campus, right. they burned down the old main and and uh, throwing, calling uh, police pigs, and uh, then I'm going back to college. Well, this is after Vietnam for Fort, Fort Lewis, but yeah. still, that was after I got back from the army period. Okay, that, that cultural shock. Okay. I didn't have that so much when I came back. Oh, okay, home. I just was, um, you know, it was kind of like dad came up and met me at. Stapleton, my brother didn't, my mother didn't come up, uh, just my dad, and uh, we kind of said, hi dad, and hi son, and we just walked out uh, uh, the airport and just, just like never anything happened. Huh. And I never talked about it to anybody for years. Wow. Because I didn't want anybody to know that I was in Vietnam. And, yeah, yeah. It's only in recent years that you've that it's really been discussed, and, and you guys and yeah. have really uh, it's been acceptable. So uh, did that uh, all those years did that eat you up inside, or were you able to were you able to put it uh, aside? Or well, uh, the thing is, is um, holding thirty nine different jobs last time I talked uh, or, or counted, I should say, I couldn't keep a job. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get interested in college. Here I had the GI Bill, and yeah, I yeah. left. That's all I wanted. I yeah, right. had my yeah. whole future. When I got back, I had uh, uh, I didn't have any desire, but I sure did drink. And then I, I had these terrible. I I had something psychologically wrong with me, but I didn't know. And I went in to talk to a doctor, and he said I needed tranquilizers. Women take tranquilizers, not men. Uh, I'm not taking. He says, "Well, you, you have a choice. Either you take tranquilizers, or you're not going to function very well." And so he talked to me about taking Valium, and uh, boy, I liked that. And then drinking with Valium really was good because boy, I had to settle me. Oh, I could, I could relax. I could sleep. That was so nice. Then I found out drinking and taking Valium. Can kill you real quickly, so then I had to quit one or the other. So I quit the value. Yeah. I just drank, and really, um, I, I was a musician, so I played in bands. So I traveled across the country and played in bands, and uh, I thought I was having a good time. Uh, I was single till I was thirty-nine. Uh, never had many. I've always had a lot of friends that they're still friends, but you know, I never made very many new friends and relationships. It's good to have relationships. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know this till years later. What in the world uh, happened to me? And you just think it's a just this is just. The way you are, yeah, you know, I didn't even think the way I was, and then the way I am now it just didn't even occur. I am what I am, and it didn't have any. The war didn't have any effect on it. I mean, uh, because you know, I really didn't go through that much, you know. Uh, to me, you know, uh, and then when the Iraqi guys, uh, they're the ones that, uh, and the Afghanistan guys, it's finally gave us the uh, the people that that started you know uh, giving us some some uh, respect I guess. right 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 yeah right. but it had not been for them we'd have still been everything had been buried and uh, so I found out 40 years later I've got PTSD and and um, and uh, now, at 68 years old, I'm going through combat counseling. 
uh, and I said, I don't need to go through combat counseling. And uh, I went kicking and screaming, but my psychiatrist wanted me to do this. And uh, that started, I didn't know how many things I still had buried. I mean, totally buried. And now they're coming to the surface, and it's going. It's, uh, now I'm dealing with them. That's tough now. I sure wish I would have been able to know this when I was younger. When you were younger, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, and, and, and have you found the counseling is helping? Oh, no, yeah. it it's helping so much, but. It's reliving things now, like this. Yeah. I've told this story uh, to you know a few people, and and uh, it's it's still hard. It's not as hard now as it used to be, but it's still. But the combat counseling brings back. It's the good thing about it is you can tell somebody's been in combat. You can tell them things you won't. That you won't tell anybody else. Yeah. You just won't. Yeah. Uh, you can't. Right, right. Um, and they, they've been in combat and they're counselors too. So it really is awesome because they understand. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I'm just going to say this uh, that's that, you know, it's like one of my biggest things that I held all these years, didn't know I had, is why, when I left Vietnam, did I not care about my the friends? I don't care. The, the ones that were there? The yeah, the ones that I, when I come home, I left Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They, uh, and then I thought years and years later, I wonder, I go to the wall to try to find, see now I'd like to know, but back then I didn't care. and I. Uh, and even the guys that got killed in our company, even that guy that I told you that wrote back yeah. to me, uh, I didn't write back to him. I don't care. And how can anybody be that non -com compassion, whatever the word, uh, not having compassion? Yeah. That's what I. But talking to a fellow combat person, I find out that's pretty standard because of the way you can't get to know people too much or and it's different if you go over as a unit or mm -hmm. or like right. a replacement because yeah, yeah. right. we never knew each other until yeah. we were in the country right right and i didn't realize that you know but um you know to uh, now i did have a, a couple close friends that i did and, and we still are very close but for the most part then went Fort Lewis, Washington when I was there. I had friends there that when I got out of the Army, uh, that was it. They were just knew they were probably going over there. How could I not care? Hmm. Uh, what is wrong with somebody? And that's what the counseling comes in. That's one thing is uh, you, you just don't understand how you have, uh, if you, you don't even understand that you change, first of all. Yeah, right. Then you don't understand yeah. when you do find out you changed, and, and then you, you don't understand that. And, uh, but you have to remember that most of us come back in shame. Uh, we really were ashamed of right. what we did on top of everything else. Uh, so we couldn't talk about it. Sure. Yeah, uh, that's understandable. Yeah. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on the war itself from, from that time when you decided you, need, you needed to serve and now we've had 40 some odd years to look back on or 30 some odd years. What, what are your thoughts have been as you, as you, as, as you, what are your thoughts on the Vietnam War and, and that whole experience, that whole war, well, the whole I, reasoning? I went over because, um, uh, our country and our people. Um, it, it was it, it was my duty, and I wanted to. Uh, we're fighting communism, uh, and my my country. I, you know, if, if I didn't, 
I didn't have to go. I right, stayed right. in school. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I had another way too I could have got out to. The musicians all knew. We had a way that, because uh, uh, we knew amphetamines before they were really popular. Mm -hmm. and, and if you take that, you have high blood pressure. So most of the musicians could get out. And I knew this, but I, and I really didn't want to go. I, I mean, I love my country, but yeah. I, I love my life too. You yeah. know? But anyway, so uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to go and um, it's the right thing to do. And so I got over there and I found out I think it's the wrong thing to do and I don't think there's any communism and I, uh, I think this is a big hoax. And then I'm listening to the people back home when I get back here and, and think, well, I'm just, I was just part of a, a big fraud hoax. Uh, so that even makes you more ashamed. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. On top of everything else. So it wasn't until I was working uh, and still working with a, a Vietnamese man who was a chopper pilot for the South Vietnamese uh, Army. He was trained by our U.S. and we got to talking and, um, and he told me what the communists did because I asked him why, why would you, why were you fighting? This, you were on the South, they, they called it the Army of the Republic mm -hmm. of Vietnam, Arvin troops. Uh, uh, because I, I really didn't think that uh, we should be there. And he yeah. said, oh, he said, those people, those communists, what they did, and he'd tell me what they did. He said, uh, and I thought, wow, maybe we were right doing that. That was two years ago. Then I'm in church. And uh, I meet a Vietnamese man uh, that was a kid over there and talking about the same thing. He said, oh, we loved you guys uh, because the communists would come down and, and what they did. And I hear these horror stories and I thought it was real. Hmm. So it was, I wasn't, we weren't a bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the, here 40 years has gone by, you know, and uh, and you had all that shame and... Right, know, right, right. So, wow, wow. Well, Dick, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any other stories that have kind of floated at the top? So. I know, I know we have, there's a lot we could probably more cover, but ideally covered your story as best we can, or, or do you think we've, we've pretty much done that? Um, yeah, I think we really have, Brad. The only thing that I can think of is, you know, um, I watched John Wayne movies, and uh, I loved Bourne movies when I was a kid, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we were always the good guys, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we're always just wonderful people. And you get over there and you find out humans are humans. And, um, and uh, I love my v Vietnam soldier brothers. I love them and I understand no matter what. But it happened, I realized, in every war. It just happens. We're not always the John Waynes that we, uh, we do think. We do bad things too. Yeah, yeah. That was crushing to me. Mm -hmm. I just was so naive that I couldn't believe that. Uh, uh, now I can understand when you're out there in, in, uh, in the field and your buddy's just got strung up in the tree and and uh, and sliced to bits. Uh, now that see that I can understand why you would want to kill every. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only Viet Cong, yeah. but every Vietnamese there is. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. can understand how that goes. But some of the, our areas was more the drugs and some of the stuff they took and, and just the enjoyment that we went over. So, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that the, um, the, uh, the thing that there's things that really bother some people, wouldn't bother somebody else, but, you know, we had dead bodies around. I, a lot of times I'd have guys come up and say, uh, Dick, come over and look, you know, look down the street. Uh, 
all oh, these dead bodies, and I, and I, I don't need, the guy, uh, the good shot in our, by the other guy, uh, you know, which I heard the shot, and I'm, I gotta write this up, but uh, I, I, I don't wanna see it. I just don't wanna see it. Anybody died, and all the stuff, that if I could help keep from seeing it, I didn't wanna see it, but body bags, those are the things that, something about body bags. When I saw my first body bags, that is the creepiest. Yeah, I just, my whole, that limp bag and there's, and you, not seeing the face and stuff is maybe, I mean, there's a, a kid in there probably. Could be an older person, doesn't matter. It's the human, it's one of our guys and that limp thing going on this plane and it just. That, yeah. Wow. So. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I really uh, I want to appreciate, uh, thank you very much for sitting down to tell your story. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank uh, you. I don't know if I've got the right to say it as uh, one vet. I think it's more of a, a vet to a, a Vietnam vet, but uh, welcome home. Oh, thank yeah. you. That means, you know, that means so much to us today because, uh, you know, it's, it, it just takes away the, the shame, it just brings a nice smile on our face. Yeah. And thank you for saying that. Very good, thank you. Okay, this is me uh, heading to Vietnam. This is at Fort Collins, Colorado, up at Horsetooth Reservoir, uh, where my parents lived and uh, this was my last day before I'm flying out to Oakland Army Base and then on to Vietnam. Mm. Okay, this is me when I arrived in Cameron Bay, which was uh, a very safe place, but with the fact that I kind of uh, got in trouble with the uh, cap the commanding officer and I, uh, uh, they wanted me to leave and go to another company that was uh, wiped out up in Duck Fo, uh, that's me in full field gear, which we never even carried rifles in Cameron Bay, and I'm, uh, with my big mouth, I'm heading now to Duck Fo. <laughs> there I am in Duck Fo now, uh, and you can see my face, I'm uh, not as happy as I was before. This uh, is our, this was the company uh, mortar had hit uh, the ammunition dump and had taken out the whole complex. You see some tents that were put up later, but this uh, took quite a few men out uh, and uh, totally destroyed the compound, and that's why I was heading up there as a replacement. And uh, that's uh, that's all of that. Boy, that must have been uh, must have been a sight to see to first pull up and see that thing and think I'm going into this. There was a lot of sights when we got off the because uh, that was four miles out of Duck Foe onto the coast and uh, just to uh, be in the jungle before you go out to the coast and seeing the infantry companies coming in with boils on them and, oh. and uh, the, the, the stair, they call it the thousand yard stair, the first thing and then they pick us up in a uh, deuce and a half truck with a 50 caliber machine gun and, uh, and I hadn't seen any of this kind of stuff till then and it was, that in itself was pretty shocking. Now that, now that is Duck Foe again, but that's with our company rebuilt, which means the tents were put up. And uh, so that is where I was for about two months. While we were in Duck Foe, of course, uh, we stockpiled ammunition. So uh, we were a transportation company, but the 101st Airborne, and I think it was a brigade, there are about 3,000 men pulled our perimeter. So we had a horseshoe around us, and that is the largest gun at that time uh, in the Army. And uh, they had on our perimeter tanks, uh, I'm talking about five, six different tanks and armored personnel carriers. They had all kinds of different cannons. They had infantry companies day and night that uh, watched us, and they had the gunships over us, 
because of the ammunition that supplied the whole AmeriCal division. Uh, we had everything in ammunition, and it was quite a target. Wow, so you were, you were sitting on top of a powder keg, huh? Well, that's what happened to the company when it was wiped out. Oh, uh, well. The Viet Cong came in and mortared and hit that right on the thing and wiped the whole uh, the the whole outfit out. Not everybody died in that, but uh, many did. While in Duck Fo, we had, uh, uh, this is called Montezuma Road, uh, that we would go in and out of Duck Fo, the village that is. And this is what you would see a lot of times on the road. That's an engineering company. Uh, and they've got, of course, their bulldozers and such. And if the picture shows it, uh, you'll see the guns and cannons on the side of a bulldozer. So the engineers, which are a lot of times the first ones in, uh, to an area and they're building roads, they're getting attacked all the time, so they have to have that kind of equipment on those machines. Mm-hmm. Now that is the largest amphibious uh, uh, boat uh, at that particular time. Uh, it's called a bark, B-A-R-C, and I don't remember what that means. You can see the person kind of standing oh, yeah. up there. Yeah. And um, this is what we traveled down 17 miles south of Duck Fo because of the monsoon. You couldn't get the boats in to uh, offload the ammunition. So we had to go down into a cove within a cove to get out of those high waves. So we were the first unit to go down into this area 17 miles away from anybody. We were supposed to be attacked that night. Intel had that we were going to be hit the night we, uh, and there was only about 20, 25 of us, and that was all filled with uh, supplies, mostly ammunition and supplies and and such, and we just all sat on top of that particular uh, boat. Now, we had no life jackets or anything, and it happened uh, that we had to go about two miles out to start heading south, and uh, it was a sun, sunny day, and uh, and we were sitting on top, and all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, it looked like a big cloud coming over. And I looked up, and it was a gigantic wave. And we started sinking down. And I don't know how boats and sea and the oceans work, but we started sinking down. That wave came way, I, I mean, it was, I swear, 100 feet tall. And, of course, I knew I was dead. Uh, and then we rose up real quick. And we hit the side, and uh, it, it, it had to be, in my mind, God is the only way I made it, and we made it out of that, because we weren't washed off the boat, uh, if we had been with no life jackets or, or, or had been tipped over or anything, but uh, uh, the first sergeant, he always had a cigar. He was sitting up there, and, and when we looked up after this horrendous, experience his cigar is just all streamed down the front of him and we just burst out laughing you know and so that was our trip down uh and shortly we were supposed to get hit uh, by a Viet Cong unit when we got there this is our next place called Sai Win um and it's between really uh, uh Bong San and uh and Duck Pho uh, it's such a small village, which I have other pictures that show the village, but that's our tents that we just set up, and it's jungle area. You can see the palm trees. And uh, now the first night that we arrived there with our 25 guys or so that we were supposed to get hit, uh, we got there kind of late. We didn't get a chance to dig in or anything at this place, knowing that we're supposed to get hit by the Viet Cong well uh, and we're 17 miles from the nearest help of any kind uh, if we do get attacked. And um, here comes a helicopter gunship just at dusk flying over us. And it uh, uh, was such a wonderful feeling and wonderful sight to see that at least there's some U.S. Army out there. And they're flying over us and they open fire with their machine guns, their mini guns. They rake our 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 perimeter and and hit a bunch of trucks nobody was killed and uh, then there was another helicopter following this helicopter and they were kind of almost like a dog fight they weren't shooting at each other but we thought that probably the Viet Cong had commandeered a US Army helicopter we couldn't figure out we found out several days later that those guys were just kind of 
they they didn't know that we were a U.S. Army unit and stuff, but uh, that was their commanding officer behind them when they seen that. So they kind of got in a lot of trouble for that. Hmm. Uh, but there is a lot of friendly fire and things like this. Sure. This is just a group of us kind of playing around uh, with some of the equipment. Uh, that's me on the right with a M60 machine gun and the guy in the middle with a grenade launcher and then... Uh, uh, just messing around, uh, didn't have anything to do that particular moment, but that's the, one of the bunkers that where you see the sandbags and stuff on top uh, to help if you get mortared or rocketed, to help a little bit uh, uh, take the concussion. And uh, again, that is Cy Win. And okay, this is called Highway One. Uh, I've got an article from the Stars and Stripes that I still happen to have talking about uh, this road was never opened. Uh, this was uh, about uh, September of 67, and they um, never was able to take it. We, they, uh, they finally took this road to where we could finally travel on it. That's why we went down in that bark, oh, okay. uh, because that, you couldn't, that it was, uh, the VC had uh, owned that road. But they opened that road up, Highway 1, and when then we had to take, I had to take one day a uh, trip uh, 17 miles into Duck Foe on that road, which was mined. They had minesweepers every morning that would sweep that road, but they would come back with the mines. And they also had C4, that's kind of the plastique that was kind of new then, I think. So you couldn't detect it. So they would put it under like the culverts or roads. So uh, at any time, uh, any time it could be blown up. Well, we were supposed to never uh, come back on that road. Our captain told us if we couldn't get back by 5 o'clock on that road, they close it, only to tanks. Uh, but the Jeep driver and I, we, it was about a quarter to 5 in Duck Foe, and we didn't want to stay there, so we decided we would come back. So we took off on the way back, and, of course, we had to have our our full field gear and our flak jackets and we had to lock and load when we were on this road and as we're going down this road it's you'll have little hills and stuff we're going up this hill and as we come down this this hill here comes a Viet Cong squad oh. about 12 guys oh, on the side of the road well we passed them so we kind of looked at them they kind of looked at us and nothing happened uh, thank God and anyway we just went on our way and they went on their way <laughs> Okay, this is Highway 1 again, and now we're leaving Cy Win. We now, I've been to Cameron Bay, I've been to, up to Duck Fo, down to Cy Win, and uh, now we're on a convoy on Highway 1 going to the third largest city in Vietnam called Quinh Yon. And this is some of my buddies that I took a picture of. I'm on that uh, deuce and a half. Uh, and uh, so we're out of the field of danger, I mean, after we get down to Quignon, basically, we're going to be in the middle of the city um, and uh, out of the field where it's been so dangerous and such. And uh, that's all. <laughs> this is Quignon. And uh, so uh, in the middle of the city there, uh, we have all the protection you can imagine and uh, wrote home telling the family I got four more months. I'm I'm uh, safe, you don't have to worry about me anymore. And on J uh, January 31st, that's when the Tet Offensive hit. Oh. <laughs> and that's when the NBA and the Viet Cong uh, went into the cities, the middle of the cities, uh, with their biggest uh, offensive. And so we were right in the middle of that thing for two and a half days. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that was uh, beyond explanation of what that was like. So just when you think you're safe any place in Vietnam, and I'm sure Iraq or Afghanistan, there are no safe places. There's no rear echelons. Uh, there are some places maybe a little safer than others, but you never know at any time when something's going to happen. Yeah, that's, uh, it was different about the Vietnam War. There was no front line, per se. No. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, that's still in Quignon, and that's the uh, last picture I'm showing, and that's my best friend, uh, uh, LL, we called him, and uh, uh, 
very, very influential person on my entire life. Uh, uh, LL was one that uh, went, went through the um, explosion, uh, the mortar attack up there in Duck Foe and uh, and uh, of course he told me some of the stories. Now that unit, our unit, won the presidential citation, uh, which he would have been, I'm very proud of him. I, of course, got up there to replace the guys that won mm -hmm. this, but they, not just, it wasn't just because of that. It was for uh, just what the uh, 264th Transportation Company had done. I might add that uh, uh, being a transportation company offloading ammunition, uh, you would think that, well, we're not infantry, so we're not basically out in the bush. Uh, however, we lost probably, uh, we lost this, m more men than some of the infantry companies that I knew of. And I think we lost the total just while I was there in our company of 325 guys. I think we lost 19. Hmm. Um, and some of those were the going on that highway uh, one uh, when they hit a mine and, and uh, there was four killed or five, I can't remember now. So that's, uh, that's the kind of the real quick uh, story through Cameron Bay, Duck Foe, and Cy Wen and Quinn Young. Now this picture has you guys in, in civvies. Uh, were you able to put on civilian clothes? I mean, uh, how, did, how, did, uh, how did that work? I mean, yeah, when you're, uh, when you're in a, uh, an area that's secured, uh, and if you, get a, uh, if you can get a half a day off, uh, you could wear civilian clothes. Oh, okay. Uh, that, now, when you're out in the field or something, you, you would never sure. do that. Right. Uh, uh, but sometimes we got to go downtown, uh, uh, and, um, and it was safe. Uh, and, uh, and my friend, LL, he was uh, really quite a pacifist. Uh, he didn't uh, take care of his rifle, and he could have got court-martialed for it, but everybody knew he's, uh, you know, uh, we called him the professor because he had a master's degree in mm -hmm. literature, and he's just an uh, extremely brilliant but compassionate person, and he just wouldn't shoot anybody. Yeah. So he never took care of his rifle, so when we had an inspection, somebody had to find his rifle, and then it was all rusted, uh, but that's the way he was, and they... Uh, you know, and they respected that. that. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, last and probably least is my current picture with some of the medals, uh, which don't depict any war her hero. This almost everybody got these medals uh, that was in Vietnam, and uh, so uh, I just kind of enjoy having those and. Uh, so that's my story, and I want to thank Brad Hoops so much for doing this uh, for our family and for us for uh, being able to remember uh, in generations to come. Thank you, Brad. No, thank you, Dick.